You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. guys super excited about this episode we are getting the opportunity today to speak with mr 1500 and mr money mustache and this episode is one that has been requested for a long time by our community and we want to do a couple things with it obviously we could talk about the how of financial independence but it's something that i think has been covered really well over the past several years and over the past like seven years on mrmoneymustache.com what we wanted to do today is have a slightly different episode almost like let's take a look back Mr. Money Mustache over the past seven years has reached millions and millions of readers. I mean, the information that him and Carl have been putting together when they've been forming this community have changed thousands and thousands of lives. Today, what we wanted to talk about is how to create reality. What's next? I mean, you're well into your early retirement, financial independence. Like what's next for you guys? Community building and second generation five. Very excited about this conversation. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. And yeah, I've certainly been looking forward to this for a very, very long time. And to your point, many of these topics are the essential themes that we talk about here at Choose FI. Community building is probably number one. And I think what Pete and Carl are doing, both generally for the FI community, but very specifically in their hometown of Longmont, Colorado, is just amazing. And clearly, second generation FI is something that is near and dear to all of our hearts on this podcast and to many of those listening. How do you pass this on to your kids? What type of lessons do you pass on? How do you make the best life for them while also understanding that their path is not necessarily yours? So it's it should be a fascinating, fascinating conversation. And with that, Carl and Pete, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot. It's been a long time coming, so we are happy to be here. Yeah, holy cow, I was way back in episode 14, and uh, how many years ago was it? It was a while ago, but it's been very cool to see your trajectory in the meantime. You guys are, are kicking ass. It was decades in internet years. You know, I was actually, Carl, I was planning on having you on the show for uh, your namesake, episode 1500, but I was worried we might have to kick the can down the road a little bit too far <laughs> to make that Yeah, happen. if a couple of years is decades in internet years, you're going to have to have me on when I'm like two or 300. Hopefully that AI stuff comes to reality. <laughs> in fact, I've watched Choose FI take off so much that now you guys are so big that we have to wait in line to be podcast oh, guests stop it. Get instead, out of of, uh, <laughs> instead of the other way around. <laughs> I was sending you Christmas cards every year year trying to make this happen. Are you kidding me? <laughs> hey, um, what I wanted to do, you know, I, I kind of set this up. Our, our community is probably, I can't think of any individual that has had their website mentioned more on our hot seat on your favorite blog or article of all time. I mean, yours has been that light bulb moment for so many people. And so I'm positive that the vast majority of our community is very familiar with your content, but what I don't know if they're as familiar with is your story. And I kind of want to rewind a little bit here and have this walk down memory lane because the blog was not your path to financial independence. You reached financial mm -hmm. independence and then you started documenting your story and your story that we started reading about happened back in like 2011. Could you just take a couple minutes and kind of talk us through what that moment was for you? Why you felt like sharing your story? Just put us back in time here for a second. Oh yeah. Okay. So the, my FI story, which has been told many times was, was boring. That was just software engineering from the years between like 1998 and 2005, roughly. Then I almost forgot that I was financially independent, but then got so frustrated that I decided to start writing about it in 2011. And that came about because I think I've told this story a lot before too, but it's basically because I was surprised that all the other high income people that I knew uh, weren't also in the same position. So it was more, it was born out of frustration. So I just started writing some stuff into a Microsoft Word document or a Google doc, I guess. And then I, then I thought, well, maybe I should try publishing this. I really have to give a lot of credit to uh, the former Mrs. M.M. because she really encouraged me to not just write it privately, but to put it online. 
And once it started finding its own audience, that was the real key. And this is probably the thing that makes or breaks almost any blogger is if you start getting enough people reading your stuff right away and commenting and giving your feedback, then you're encouraged to keep going. And keeping going is the real key to success. But almost nobody can keep going in the absence of feedback. So I was super lucky because of like the early retirement extreme guest post that I did. It was like a free round of initial readers and and so many, so many pieces of good luck uh, is what kept me going to this point. And now it's really easy because I can just write stuff occasionally. Can we just talk just for a second about your notable lack of a mustache? Like, like I feel with that moniker, you should have like fur, you know, coming down. Like we're recording this. We have video for this. No mustache, man. So where does the moniker come from? Um, well, the mustache is seasonal. Like sometimes I would grow it again, but that's not really what the blog is about. It's not about a facial hair mustache. It was about... Like the, you know, first of all, triple M just sounds good and money and you must stash your cash. And the idea of like the old senior Western gunslinger slash mayor of, you know, a town. It was basically just like a random kind of bit of inspiration that gave me that name. It doesn't have an exact literal meaning, but I have certainly grown out mustaches occasionally in order to try to be in character. And to be honest, I'm not willing to put in that level of commitment because you have to like comb that, you know, clean soup out of it. And uh, it's just not worth it for a part-time hobby of being a blogger. Pete, I'm curious about that inception point of of when you started the blog. I think myself included and, and so many, really hundreds of thousands of people just love your writing style. It just draws you in. Have you always been a writer? I mean, you're an engineer. Did you know that you were going to be this good? Did you always love writing, right? Like, Please go on. Can we go on? (laughs) No, but I mean, it's a real, real serious question. I've I've always been curious. How does a guy who is the ultra optimizer engineer get to be such a creative writer? Okay. Well, the my secret is that I'm not really an engineer. It's true that I like optimizing stuff and I was okay at math and, and good at software development. But really, I'm born from a long line of artsies, like sort of hopelessly disorganized writers, artists, musician people. I pay the price for that in terms of like never being able to find my car keys and my wallet or any of this stuff. Well, fortunately, you have a but bike. I, so most of that is unnecessary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and in fact, I think early retirement was partly a, uh, whatever, a coping mechanism for me in not wanting to stress about like money making and keeping track of careers and stuff. I was just like, well, why don't we just do this another way, put it all on autopilot so I can focus on doing what I really want to do. So um, I think writing and music are one of those things that is kind of like has a real artsy side to it in a human. And this, you can certainly nurture that, but there's also a lot that you're born with or born without. So in my family, you get a lot of free, like thanks to my dad's heritage, you get a lot of free music and writing ability. And that's what he did. He was like a jazz musician and a writer for his whole career. So, um, yeah, I'm thankful for that. And so that just means I have fun with it. That's all. Cool. You know, I, I've never done this on the show before and I, I just, I want to do it today. So with you guys, with your guys permission, I actually want to take like two minutes and read the first guest post that Minister Money Mustache ever did one month, basically, right? Pete, after starting your blog on early retirement extreme, would you humor me for this exercise? (laughs) I feel like that's pretty long, but yeah, you're welcome to give it a shot. I haven't seen this thing in many years. Awesome. A few months ago, I had an inexplicable need to start writing about personal finance. Why? Because the people of the United States just need some serious schooling. And I couldn't hold back the urge to add my voice to the still small chorus of people dishing out these lessons. Every time I walk past a Starbucks drive through lineup of idling Cadillac Escalades, and then return home to read about record levels of foreclosures, bankruptcies, and complaints about our recently inflated but still cheap gasoline, I become fired up again. Every time people complain about not having enough money to raise their kids while continuing to buy new products on credit, it forces me to write even more. The reason I must write is because I am somewhat of an alternate version of Jacob. Originally a software engineer by training, I could not help but try to optimize my money earning and spending in the same way that software engineers compulsively optimize their code to be as simple and efficient and self-evident to future software engineers as possible. In the industry, they call it elegant. To me, money feels just like software. If your earning and spending is not elegant, then it's crappy. And if you're causing suffering to you and your species and planet by not optimizing, it's an emergency. Because of this optimization, my software engineering career was short-lived. I had put aside enough money to support a middle-class lifestyle with a wife and young son shortly after the age of 30, so it was no longer efficient to keep trading free time for more money. And it turned out that not having a real job was a lot of fun. 
I took on all the challenges and hobbies I never had time for. I got to read, write, exercise, learn, camp, hike, bike, drink fine beer and wine, even on weeknights. Sweep the driveway on Thursday mornings in my pajamas, and my wife and I get to be double stay-at-home parents. Our five-year-old boy is completely flourishing with this unlimited attention as we read through hundreds of books together and keep advancing to new levels of learning in our sorts of fields. But the rest of the world was not getting any more efficient. I saw the gullibility of the poor and the middle-class citizens of the rich world, and in the way in which more advanced corporations are able to take advantage of this gullibility to keep everyone forking over most of their income and debt payments. And it just seemed more ridiculous with each passing year. At first, I spent my creative energy on making fun of people. It is, after all, kind of funny to watch people causing their own financial destruction and then angrily blaming the president for their fate. But then I realized it would be even more fun to try and change the behavior of some of these people. At this point, I discovered the early retirement extreme blog as well as assorted other ones on the internet. And so a new superhero was born. His name is Mr. Money Mustache. And he is basically the persona that constantly is talking inside my head when I see the rest of the world making stupid financial decisions. Mr. Money Mustache is bossy. And he has strong opinions, but he's also quite knowledgeable and a good listener. He's like a good set of windshield wipers to keep the windows of his readers clear from the shit that rains every day from the world's marketing machines. <laughs> All right. There's a couple other paragraphs in here, but I died. This is you, 2011, one month after you start writing, writing this post on Jacob from Early Retirement's Extreme blog. And wait, the best part, I just want to, I want to reach down here, put in context that I think Almost seven years in, I think you've had like 29 plus million visitors on the site at this point. I, I noticed this comment on that blog. Jeremy says, hi, MMM. I read a little bit of your blog and I'm loving it already. In about seven years of blogging, the only constant trend I see are more readers and more bloggers. People are dialing down to their favorite content. And if you can at least provide something semi-unique, I am sure you will get plenty of readers. So that was one of your early feedbacks on a guest post. Carl, what are your thoughts on that article, man? Uh, I had actually never read it. This is my first time. So I'm uh, going <laughs> to try to absorb it all. But yeah, I think about Mr. Money Mustache's trajectory. And it's, uh, we ended up at the same place. We came back. We came from different places, though, which uh, I think about often. I think Mr. Money Mustache probably had a little bit more stable of a childhood than I did. So the reason I'm here today is because uh, I could see the mistakes my parents made with finances. And it terrified me to put this fear in my soul as a young kid. And uh, my dad struggled with alcohol, alcoholism, so there were struggles growing up. So uh, I've kind of questioned myself, like, am I even worthy to be here? Because Mr. Money Mustache had this perfect upbringing, and he came to all these realizations because of the right for the right reasons, whereas myself, I came from a point of fear. And I guess that's okay. I've come to reconcile that as it doesn't really matter where you come from, it's where you ended up. And now I'm happy and uh, our trajectory is pretty similar. So I'm happy with it now. But yeah, that's a hell of a post. Yeah, that's funny because we we literally ended up in the same place because Carl is just on the other side of this door behind me right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and guys, one thing that was in that article that I really want to touch on is change of behavior. Pete, in there, you said like, it's easy to kind of laugh at people but you realize that you wanted to help change people's behaviors and people can read and they can, they can read blogs, they can listen to podcasts, but getting people to actually get up off the couch and take action is what separates successful people from, from those who are just going to keep on doing what they're doing. Have you guys found, and Carl, I guess let's start with you. Have you found in your writings, anything that actually gets people to change their behavior. Even like a couple of actionable tips that jump off the top of your mind that you've noticed that's more successful than not. Like Jonathan and I talk about this a lot here. We would love to bring this concept to more people, but there's a different message for everybody. There's certain things that, that sink in better than others. And I, I just love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah. Well, first of all, I will tell you what does not work and what doesn't work, especially for me is telling people, especially in the real life. If you tell people they're making a mistake or call out some errors you think they're making, they're going to be even more resistant and they're going to fight you. So the conclusion I have came to for myself is to lead by example, just show what an awesome life you're having and what you're doing and let people come to ask you about it. There's an old saying that goes, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And there's different kinds of stimulus that might make the student ready. If someone goes through a, a real bad financial hardship, if there's a recession or they're, they're going to lose their house. That might be a point where you can get to someone. 
So if the message is ready, when they need to hear it, uh, they're going to learn and it's going to resonate with them. And I think about this because that's how I came to this whole movement. So I was a saver and we were pretty frugal, but I still had a big house. We were buying new cars. And then I had a bad day at work and I Googled, how do I retire early? And boom, up comes J.D. Roth and Mr. Money Mustache. So that was an inflection point in my life. I don't know if I would have been ready for the message if I didn't have that stress and that hardship in my life. Similarly to Carl, leading by example is a great idea. And more importantly, um, if you're a blogger, it's good to sort of apply the same things that they teach authors when they're trying to write fiction, which means don't do what most financial websites and blogs do, which is just to lay out a bunch of principles and definitely ignore the old principles of journalism, which is where you write yourself out of the story. I think for finance or behavior change, you want to be a character in your story where you're telling the story of your own life and it has to be a life that your readers would want to live. So you should be talking about what you did that day and like details too, like not just my wife picked up the kids in the car. It has to be like the old 94 Accord, you know, wheezed into the driveway and stuff. Things that you learn, people want to hear details of your life. They want to live like you and you have to be personable. And basically they have to feel like they are your friend. And if they want your life, then they're more likely to listen to the tips that you're giving on how to live that life. I love what you said in particular about be a character in your story or, or like have a story that other people will want to emulate, right? Because that is, I'm just trying to put myself in those shoes circa 2012. I'm reading about this character on the internet called Mr. Money Mustache who doesn't have a mustache, but his life is awesome. And apparently it's happening on 25 to 27 K a year. And I just wanted to show you this. We're on video. I wanted to show you this and see if this looks familiar. Ah, Yes, that is <laughs> right. indeed a gadget that I have in my own house. <laughs> All right, wait, I want to that. <laughs> All right, Brad. So this <laughs> this is great for the podcast audience. I know it this looks is... like it's not uh, installed though. What's going on? Well, I had to take it down to show you. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. This is the Ematic <laughs> Energy Management Solution. So there was a post on Mr. Money Mustache talking about finding vampire drain in your house. And if you're going to optimize your finances, you're going to optimize your food. Why would you not optimize your electricity bill? So this device was posted as a wonderful source to identify. And I can tell you that my wife held it against you for a couple of weeks because for about a two week period of time, I was going through the house, turning off breakers, checking to see what my expected output on this would be determined to like when everything is off for us to be down at zero. I never got it there. There's still like a five I don't know if it's kilowatt or 15 kilowatt. There's a vampire oh, thank drain. Goodness, it's not that, or you'd have like a thousand dollar electric bills every month. See, but I, yeah, I don't know these terms, but basically uh, I don't know these terms of which you speak, but basically I was like mm -hmm. messing around with the air conditioning. I was messing around with all the blue lights and LEDs, but you know, it doesn't really matter. The larger point is because of the character that you were writing about this, Mr. Money mustache and these little projects that didn't seem like they, they were just small. Like not everything was, Hey, go invest in your 401k. It wasn't all academic. Some of it was just life and looking for ways to operate at the margins. This was really one of my true introductions to the aggregation of marginal gains without those words. But because you got me interested in little silly things like this, I then listened to your advice on other things. And I think for me, if I look back, being willing to try that was also being willing to look towards alternative forms of information that could take myself and my family to a better place. I just want to kind of tie that back, maybe Brad, to your point, like what role has Mr. Money Mustache had in your own journey to financial independence? I think clearly, and, and P, we were actually at the Phi Summit a couple of weeks back, and I did a, an entire presentation on inflection points in my life. I actually left out the ones, the inflection points on my, my Phi journey. And the very first one was finding the shockingly simple math article. And I mean, that was like one of those lightning bolt type moments for me where it just changed everything. It's basically like where you, after you take in some information, like you quite simply cannot see the world the same way you saw it before. So just something like that. I know that changed my entire life, but I, I guess, uh, my question to you, Pete, and, and Carl, I'd be curious as well for your, your thoughts after Pete, you talk about, you know, this character of Mr. Money Mustache. Do you think of him as a character? Is he a slightly embellished version of Pete? Is he a significantly embellished version of Pete? And when people meet you in real life, do they expect you to be Pete the normal guy or this superhero who talks about face punches and, and all these other things on the blog? Yeah, they usually expect me to be a bit more bold than I am, like I'm kind of soft-spoken in real life. And 
I've learned the hard way that people don't want to hear advice in person. You know, sometimes they'll ask a specific, specific question and you can answer that specific question. But people in the Starbucks lineup don't want me to be walking down like in the stupid uh, drive through and like saying how stupid they are through each window and especially not punching them in the face. So I do like <laughs> the whole so physical way, face like, punches things. It's just, it doesn't go over quite as well in person. <laughs> yeah. And so like, I'm, I'm not a violent person physically in real life, but I certainly have a violent imagination and I really do feel quite a visceral frustration with how stupid stuff is in the way the United States is like just wasting this incredible opportunity for prosperity that we have. Like we're pretty good, even though we waste 75% of every dollar that goes to our economy because we're just so inefficient. So I just see what could be. And I'm like, why can't you just claim this? Like at least take the easiest low hanging fruit. So that frustrates me to no end. So Mr. Money Mustache lets me voice those frustrations in loud curse word infested or in enhanced <laughs> dialogue that I wouldn't say to real people. Yeah. So I've always thought about Mr. Money Mustache as Pete on steroids. Uh, the first time I met him, I think it was, would have been way back in 2013. I was, I was so nervous. I was actually shaking on my drive up to Longmont. My wife is like, what the hell's wrong with you? I'm like, it's Mr. Money Mustache, this guy who's changed my life. We're, we, we get to talk to him. Oh my God. Oh my God. And then I meet him and he's just like an average normal guy. So I'm always humored by how people react to him here at headquarters. And I will say that there's no shortage of people who look kind of like Pete, like guys who wear flannel with beards and facial hair are, are a bit overrepresented. So sometimes someone will be looking through the window at our headquarters and they'll see someone else who they think is Pete. And I've always wanted to screw with them like, hey, <laughs> pretend you're Pete. It just <laughs> threatened them with a punch in are the you, face. Are you <laughs> saying that there are better representations of Mr. Money Mustache inside Mr. Money Mustache headquarters than Pete himself? Oh, yeah. There's definitely some more manly proper Colorado dudes here that I would use as a stunt double if we were making a movie. Yeah. That is, that is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about this community and the headquarters just for a second here. Going back to Brad's question, like the inflection points in your journey, do you have any big moments that you remember, including the community headquarters that have been kind of like a guiding light for you and would give our audience some insight into kind of what drives you now? For me, it's been uh, a more, not really inflection points, but like a gradual change. So first starting a blog to begin with was a giant thrill and I was excited to have comments at all. And then I would do everything. I would say yes to everything for the blog. I remember even when people said, hey, I'm in Longmont for the weekend. Can I stop by and go for a beer or something? I used to say yes to that because I was so starved for meeting like-minded people and attention maybe and variety in my life. But then as that got more and more overwhelming, I dialed that back. And then I, then I was doing a series of trips related to the blog. And, and then I realized those aren't really satisfying because you could spend your whole life traveling and not really meeting any real life nearby friends in your town. So the headquarters, which is a co-working space, was a way to address, like, let's take all of the benefits of community that a blog or online platform gives you, but make it real in a way that can make your life better in real life. So starting it here, you basically have to live nearby in order to have any value of joining our, our club here. So we're pretty much automatically harvesting a bunch of interesting, fun, friendly people who are all a little bit unusual because you have to go out on a limb to join something started by an internet guru. And because of that, it's been really fun. And these are real friends. And now we find ourselves going out on hikes or bike rides with them, or like some of us are playing music together and our kids are meeting and all this other stuff. So it was just a gradual refinement of what starts out as an opportunity. And then you, you, and this is like applicable to everybody who goes into financial independence, early retirement, because you're not going to know exactly what you want because you've never been in this position of unlimited adult freedom before. Once you have it, you can start experimenting on yourself and figuring out what it is that really gives you the best life. That's what Carl and I are doing. We're just doing it a little bit more in public than our average uh, readers might be, I guess. Carl, I'm curious, like what's been the most surprisingly positive thing to come out of, of being involved in this real co-working space where you, as Pete said, you're getting together with people in your community. He's talking about playing music. You know, I know you guys lift weights in the back. You could have anticipated things like that. Has there been something unanticipated that has added just a lot of value to your life? Yeah, it's, it's really amazing on a lot of different levels. So to answer this question, you have to understand what a co-working space is really about. So on the surface, you might think it's just a place where people go and work because they don't want to work at home. And that's part of it because everyone could work at home, but they could work in the library. So what a co-working space is really about 
is meeting other people and having interactions with other people. And then it goes beyond that. It becomes, like Pete said, it's a community building thing. Besides the working, we have events on weekends. We have all this other fun stuff going on here. But the really fun thing to see is some of the magical interactions. And uh, one of them happened a couple of weeks ago. Someone came in and I was talking to him. I'm like, hey, so what's your full-time job? He was still at work. He's like, well, I work for this company that made their name with auctions on air-cooled old Porsches. So I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. So then a couple of minutes later, I introduced her to someone else. And she said, what do you do? He's like, I work for this car auction website. And she's like, oh, that's interesting. My dad has this old crappy like Porsche 911 in his garage that he's been looking to get rid of. And boom, they've made this connection that they would not have had that probably would have never happened in the world outside the co-working space. And there's been a bunch of other things like that where people are collaborating on things. Uh, we're talking about starting a brewery and all these crazy other things. So at the very surface, it's a co-working space. At the bottom, it's what's the real meaning of it comes from the community aspect, though. And we're much more than a co-working space. If you think about it, is that, is that you're thinking about it incorrectly? And actually, just a quick another story that's similar is two members who didn't know each other before. They have teamed up and gone into casual business together to buy the building right next door to headquarters here. So now we've effectively doubled our control of Main Street, Longmont. You know, we own these two adjacent buildings and they have big properties in the back. And and now we can collaborate and have bigger stuff happening. And we're enhancing each other's value by running our two buildings in ways that that help each other. So that's just another cool thing that wouldn't happen if we hadn't pulled in all these random people. Brad, what do you think if we can set up like a Chooseify uh, co-working space here for maybe 2020? Maybe, guys, we could do like a sister franchise type thing here. And uh, a little, you know, if you're coming on the West Coast, East Coast, you can just pop on in, something like that, right? I think we've actually talked about that exact same thing because since we've started this, the other thing I didn't mention is I've had just two people this week contact me about starting their own spaces. I'm like, great, if you do one in Atlanta and the other one was in Maine, I'm like, let's have a reciprocity agreement where we could share each other's space when we're in each other's neck of the woods. So yeah, do it. Choose a HQ.com. <laughs> we need one so bad. No, that's, Brad, we need a that's layer. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. And, and Pete, I mean, you said a minute ago about really not having this much freedom and, and free time in your adult life. I think so many of us just go through the motions, frankly, right? Like that's the hamster wheel that a lot of us that we talk about here at Choose a Fi, where you know, you're just going off to work because that's what adults do. And you come back home and you sit in front of the TV. I'd love to hear like how this actually impacts. So obviously you're running this co-working space. Let's even put that aside and just say like, how does this look on a regular day-to-day -day basis? Like how has this become part of your life? Even from like sun up to sundown, like, are you at the co-working space for two hours a day, five hours a day? Like, are you lifting weights in the morning, brewing beer in the afternoon. And obviously that sounds like an idealized version, but you know, if someone is thinking about starting like something like this in Maine, how would you even describe what they're expected to get out of it on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week timeline? The good news is that it's very flexible and you can kind of divine it how you want it. So I've traditionally spent between zero and five hours a day at this co-working space. So I definitely don't come in every day. But as it gets more fun, I've been coming in more often. And uh, especially like now with Carl and Mindy as co-owners, there's a lot more fun happening here. So it draws me down here more. But I live within a walking distance of the place. So every time I need to get out of the house, I'll usually come down perhaps with like a workout, some weight training as the excuse. And then that will always lead to more stuff. Like I'll do some cleaning up and then get into some conversations and then maybe fold open my laptop and do some work. So I like the fact that it's unscheduled and random and it's open-ended. Other people are probably a little bit more schedule-driven than me. Uh, I will say that the more time you spend at your co-working space as an owner, the faster it will grow because your, you know, your members will find that energy and, and find themselves hanging around more. And you'll, have, you'll be able to keep it in better condition, you know, setting things up sooner and meeting people's needs sooner, like extension cords or plants or sweeping or whatever else you want to do. So I was a little lazy for the first year of operation of the co-working space. It still did pretty well, but it is doing a lot better now that we're putting more energy into it. Did Carl come in like a bolt of in energy lightning and just <laughs> took it to a 10? He did. <laughs> it was like Instagram account the first day and Twitter account. And then he's adding pictures and then adding Google listings. And yeah, we've signed up something like 25 new members just since Carl joined. And then that's 
made me double down my energy again. So we are, I think it's going to be all up from here, which is, it was already so great. It's, it could potentially become like the studio 54 of Longmont. <laughs> well, you know, I did see you guys host Alan Donegan with this pop-up school. I know that guy even got some coverage from uh, PBS. Uh, it, mm-hmm. it looked like it was just an incredible opportunity. And I think it only goes, it only continues to grow from here. Yeah. Yeah, it's been really good. So one thought I always had, Pete and I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago, and that conversation was, I in the past, I've always really wanted to own uh, a storage locker facility because I thought it would be minimal time devoted to it while you've got money coming in. But since then, I've changed it. I, I think the best business to be in is a co-working space because there is money coming in, but you also have this awesome social interaction. Uh, the co-working space makes me a better person, like what Pete said Everything about it doesn't just happen here. We have a Thursday hike, so we'll we'll all go for a big hike with a bunch of members from the space, and we've got these events on weekends. I'll come here for a date night with Mindy on Sunday night. We'll be like, hey, the kids are playing with their friends. Let's walk over to HQ and, and have a drink. So Sweet my life is- Sweeps the floors, pick up garbage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it like gives the, some meaning. But. It's like the country club of Phi. <laughs> it is. It is. It kind of is. My life is better because of it. Yeah. The funny part is a storage locker business. I used to think the same thing. Yeah, it's a passive income and it's a growing market, but you're actually wrecking a little bit of your town by running such a thing because you're wasting land that could be used for something productive. And you're encouraging people to wreck their lives, which is holding on to stuff and paying to store it when when pretty much everything in storage should be like Craigslisted. It's a sign that people have gone too far in most cases, long-term storage. So a co-working space, it feels good in your heart because you know that Almost everybody who's a member is getting constant lifetime benefits from that and, and helping each other. I would I would it's, struggle if Mr. Money Mustache owned a, strug- a storage facility. I would struggle with the contrast between those two. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> Dumbest thing There's ever. Of- <laughs> People that are having storage units. How do, how do you make your money? Storage units. <laughs> <laughs> One other random thing I'll say about the co-working facility is we like it because we could do some good in the community too. We're sponsoring Bike to Work Day next month. We let nonprofits use the space at night when it's not being used. So it feels good to be able to give back to people who need a meeting space, but can't afford to pay $100 an hour or whatever they cost. So I really like that aspect. Hey, Carl, I'm curious. So obviously, most of the people listening to this podcast aren't in Longmont. They're not in areas where there are these FI or Mustachian co-working spaces. Are there any things that people can take and start up tomorrow? that you think would help foster community? Because ultimately that's what we're talking about here, right? We're talking about community and human interaction and connection. Can you think of just a couple off the top of your head that you think people could make moves on tomorrow? Yeah, I can actually. One of the things we have to help supplement the co-working space is a Slack channel. So even if you don't have some physical environment, start up a Slack channel and hit up your local Choose FI group and invite interesting people uh, there's a lot of people who don't come to the co-working space on a regular basis, but will hit up the Slack channel if they need help or if they want to have a barbecue and want to invite some people over. So start building your community locally through the Slack channel. F- find some interesting people and uh, have them on there. That's probably the number one tip I can state. Cool, Carl. So Slack channels, any other tips? Yeah. One thing that does very well, I find throughout the world is your own Shoesify Facebook group. So whenever people ask me, how do I find community? That's usually my first suggestion because uh, I know the Denver one, and now we even have a Northern Colorado one because the Denver one got so big. There's there's usually a lot of good people on there. And I don't see a lot of nastiness, which might be typical of the uh, a Yahoo group or some other group. So yeah, join your local Shoesify group. And if there's not one, Ask Brad and Jonathan to create one. Cool. Well, we got so much more to cover, but I don't really want to totally walk away from this. I, I think Brad, and you can just nod if you if you concur, I think we should try to make working with these guys on making more of these co-working spaces with the reciprocity agreement in place. I think that could be a really valuable part and an obvious next play to really help these local groups for an actual community in their community. I mean, that's that's really what this comes to. Guys, a lot more that we want to cover. I appreciate you humoring us on some of these questions. One thing that came to mind for me that I think our audience would be fascinated by is looking at the second generation FI conversations. You both have kids. They're either about to be teenagers or are teenagers. I know Pete, in your case, your, your son is helping you with your YouTube channel and he's documenting some of these money lessons. And plus he's had the benefit of kind of watching you model this behavior over time. 
what do you think is connected to the next generation? What do you think he's already picked up? What are you still working on? And uh, maybe even talk to us for a couple minutes about college planning, that sort of thing. Yeah, I have definitely strong opinions about childhood. And it's funny because Carl mentioned earlier, he thought that I had a perfect childhood. And it's kind of the opposite. I had a bit of a hippie style upbringing. There's four of us siblings. So we were a lot of the times left to fend for ourselves, like especially on activities and and finances perspective, but that really helped. So the biggest thing my parents did right, other than reading us Lord of the Rings and all the other well, of course. classics, <laughs> is that they did not get us much of anything. Like we had to take care of our own, you know, like as a kid, you couldn't just have whatever you wanted. The Christmases were pretty small, like present wise. And as soon as we were 14 or 15 years old, we were pretty much paying for our own clothing. And, you know, you still got free rent and, and food, but that was about it. So we had to pay for most or all of our own university educations as well, get part-time jobs. I remember cutting the half acre grass with this crappy gas powered lawn boy, lawn machine, like even when I was about 10 years old or 11 or 12. So I was forced to be frugal because it was really hard to get money and I didn't want to just lose it right away. So that was my upbringing. And I tried to keep the best parts of that for my son while removing some of the stuff because I don't want him to have a perspective of shortage or cheapness or uh, lack of generosity. I want him to feel all those things are on the positive side, but I also want him to feel like money is something that's finite and it comes from your own efforts, not just from begging your parents. So that every time he wants to buy something, it has to be a trade-off like, okay, this is less money I'm going to have for the future. And money also can lead to passive income and early retirement if you invest it instead of just leaving it sitting around. And I think my son has picked that stuff up because he now has uh, his own sort of bank account, which I keep track of. And he, I see him making these decisions like he thinks about something rather than just buying it. And he trades off mentally between one thing or the other. And he appreciates the fact that his interest is growing every month. I think he has something like $1,400 to his name right now. It's pretty good for a 13-year-old. Nice. And so passive income from that is more than $10 a month, which is like a solid video game every He's two months. He's got a if perpetual you video game machine. <laughs> yeah. As long as he doesn't go too crazy. So I've always paid him for things that are genuinely payable, like usually just small sums. But now he's helping me with this YouTube project that we are doing. I'm really only doing my YouTube channel in or as a way to collaborate with him on something because it's like super fun bonding. But I'm paying him like $20 an episode for the video um, editing because he's actually a genuinely skilled video editor and we're splitting revenue from the YouTube channel, which has now made like over a thousand dollars. So he's made $500 from that. So now I'm wondering, okay, are we going to go too far? Cause if this channel takes off, he could be making like a young adult type of money <clears throat> by the time he's 14 years old. And, and this is a big concern for me. I don't want him to like get a distorted perspective of how easy it is to earn money. And I think that's the trap of wealthy or middle-class people in general is that we pamper our kids too much and like, don't worry, junior, your only job is getting good grades. We're going to pay for your college. We're going to buy for your, your car for you. And then we're going to get you the down payment. We're going to pay for your wedding. And there will be a nice estate for you at the end. Like all that stuff, I think is quite risky. It has a, a risk of like making your kid not ever have the, the benefit of having to work hard and, and find their own way money-wise. So I'm trying to recreate, I'm trying to simulate that because we as a family are wealthy enough that he wouldn't have to work ever. But I think that would basically ruin his life. And, and also I think big inheritances and stuff like that are, are not really a great idea either, because if you do your job as a parent, your kid's going to be fine. So they don't need your money when you die. Pete, let's say you're teaching your son these lessons, which obviously you are over you know many years, regardless of you're not sitting down and overtly teaching him, but he's getting this by being part of this household, right? And let's just say, this YouTube channel does blow up. And because of skills he's picked up as a video editor, and I assume maybe on screen, whatever it may be, like he's picking up real world skills and he's earning money from this. Is working a traditional job a requirement or would that be sufficient if he's picked up these skills and he's picked up this knowledge of understanding that money isn't infinite? Is working in a traditional job, like does he have to do that? I would say it's probably there's a no, probably that's no, it just depends on the person. But I'm thinking back to my traditional jobs. I didn't even know that the internet was going to become a big thing when I was, a, when I became an adult, but now it, there's no denying that this is real. And this is how most of the world's money is made is like through 
something at least that goes through the internet but whether or not it's like strictly all online like like our stuff is now it's it's still an important skill so out of marketable skills being good at online stuff is probably the most you know which includes knowing how to use a computer and and sometimes knowing how to write software which he's also getting quite good at um yeah i really don't have a a big problem with what he's doing i just wanted to also appreciate manual labor for its own joy because um there's something you get out of that that you can't get out of even being the best computer user in the world is being able to use your body and your hands for something is like a real blessing that can't be can't be replaced it's a very very core human thing so my next job as a dad is to make sure he picks that up is the manual side of life Carl, do a little compare and contrast here. You know, I guess rule number one, don't ruin your child, right? What are your guys' thoughts with what the plan is for them? I mean, is college just an obvious, everybody has to go to college, you're going to go to college, or is this an ongoing conversation? What are your thoughts? No, I think uh, college is probably the right answer for most kids. It, despite what you end up doing, even if you're going to be an entrepreneur, I, I valued college. I liked my time there, but I don't think it's a slam dunk like it used to be. I remember when I was growing up, my mom was like, you are going to go to college. And and that was it. And thinking back, that seems kind of silly. Like not everyone should go to college or needs to go to college. But one of the things we try to do now with our own kids is try to introduce them to entrepreneurial concepts. For example, this summer and last summer, we worked on a bird and bat house business with our children. One of them gets it. One of them doesn't. But we're trying to show um, what it goes into, what goes into starting your own business, how you market it, how you have to build this, how you have to pay for raw materials and all all that type of thing. So we're definitely trying to give them other ideas, but it's a struggle. Even if they do go to college, similar to what Pete was saying, I think it's important, no matter how much money you have, that your kids think they have some kind of skin in the game. So even if we have infinite money at that time, and we kind of have that now. I'll probably still have my kids pay for part of it. And maybe we'll swoop in there at the end and help them pay off their loans. But I think it's important for them to know that they have to work, that nothing is just handed to them because that's not how life is like. Carl, I'm curious. So you said there with this business that you guys created, one of your daughters got in and one didn't. And I'm curious, like, where you see that otherwise with money lessons? How do you tailor the message to your two daughters who really are both obviously different ages. I believe one's nine and one's 12 right now, but they have different personalities and, and different ways of approaching this. Have you found a message that works for each of them? Yeah. And just to go back a second, I think uh, I've heard people say I'm a born saver. And I think there's something to it. There's definitely a genetic component because even our older daughter, when she was six, we'd go to the store, she'd have some money and I'd be like, well, you can buy this, but if you buy it, that money is gone forever and you won't have a chance to buy anything or you could save it and it earns interest and almost like 99 times out of 100, she would say, okay, dad, I'm not going to buy this. I think it would be better to keep the money in the account. Our other child, the younger one, she's like, okay, um, I want that stuff sloth from Target. I'm like, really? Once you spend it's, that, you, it's you already a collectible. have like, <laughs> yeah, limited edition, right? I'm like, once that money's gone, once that money's gone, it's gone. She's like, oh, I don't care, dad. I want it. Just Hashtag take it out of my YOLO. bank account when you get home. <laughs> and, and, and I try to teach them compound interest. So I pay them like 1% a month, which is significant. And the younger one will be like, why does, why does Claire get more money than me? Well, it's because Claire has saved more than me. Well, it's not fair. So I think she'll get it eventually, but uh, I just have to keep working at it. Hey, Pete, before you talked about teaching your son how to do things with his hands and build things. And, and I'm curious about doing hard things generally. And I think this might even play into exercise and lifting weights. I have never lifted weights in my entire life until, yeah, seriously. Like, oh, okay. There's a happy ending to this. It's not yeah, yeah, yeah. No, until about two years ago when I started CrossFit and I really liked it, but I realized I really wanted to get stronger. And I, I recently tried a program called Strong Lifts. And it's, it's just this really great app, essentially works on like squats and deadlifts and overhead press and bench press. And I mean, this program basically works on, on the main compound movements. And literally yesterday, I was in my basement doing a personal record at squats. I just felt so good about myself because I could have been sitting on a couch watching TV. I'm down there working my ass off. It's something that I never knew I would have enjoyed. It's something that I never would have even entertained, but yet 
this has become a big part of my life. And I think a lot of it comes down to doing hard things. I know David Kane on Raptitude has an article called The Art of the Hard Part. And he talks about coming out of the hole at the bottom of a squat and just how mentally difficult it is. But man, how good do you feel about yourself when you do that? And if you haven't read that article, I definitely recommend it. But but I'd love to hear your thoughts on doing hard things generally and, and specifically like I know weightlifting is a big part of your life. I'd, l- I'd just love to hear your thoughts. Yep. That's pretty much the secret to everything is you get happier when you do things that are challenging to you. And it's probably like a curve. There's a sweet spot between if life is too easy, you're depressed. And if life is too hard, like you're in a war zone and you're losing your children, you're starving, you're also not happy at all. But there's a sweet spot of effort and exertion and difficulty And luckily, you can choose it in the rich world here. Like you can choose to park at the far end of the parking lot or walk to the store. And of course, that's harder than parking like right next to the produce and reaching out of your window and putting and then driving to the gross, you know, to the checkout and swiping your car, which is what drive throughs are like our society. Its biggest downfall is it goes so far in convenience that it takes away the good parts of the effort, too. And that wrecks your life. So doing squats is a great example. That's an extreme one, but I pretty much need to do something difficult every day. This is my biggest revelation of the first 13 years of retirement or whatever. No difficulty means not a good day. I go to bed less happy those days. So I make sure I get out for like that hour walk and and workout. And if I'm going to go to the grocery store, I'm not going to take a motor vehicle because that's too easy. And running the co-working space is easier than not Sorry, it's harder. Running the co-working space is harder than not running a co-working space, but that makes me happier. And all these principles, it's so magical because those are also the same principles that make you wealthier too. Like, cause you're, you're going to spend less money if you choose wisely and you're going to get higher rate of pay if you're an employee or a business owner who's choosing the harder path. So it's amazing how like the whole secret to a good human life is pretty much do hard stuff and embrace it. So I'm glad you've discovered that too. All right, guys. So what I wanted to do next, I have a couple of like rapid fire questions for you. And I just thought it'd be kind of interesting to put these in one particular place. And I, I think I know what your answer is going to be for many of these, but I think it'll still be valuable for us and for our audience. So let's start with uh, the word retirement. Pete, come on, man. Be honest. Look how busy you are. Are you really retired? Uh, well, I'm not very busy. Um, and yes, I am retired. But I I did have to change the official definition of retirement for the United States just to make sure people understood because it was kind of ridiculous before. It just involved like golf and television and, and that wasn't acceptable to me. So it's good now. Internet retirement police have officially given you a tag on your Wikipedia page for the definition of retirement. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's another one for you. Brad, I'm gonna do one more and then you can do the next one. Yeah, go for it, please. All right, here's another one for you. So uh, both of you are very, very optimized individuals and you have optimized your finances to the point where working is optional, regardless of your definition of retirement, which has been updated. The question is, Pete, pay off your house or invest? So many people in the financial independence community think that paying off the house is a suboptimal decision. You have a paid off house. Where do you come down on this? It's pretty close. Like if you're just thinking about the numbers, it's not even a huge difference. So I always tell people to go by what their heart tells them. And for me, there, you know, I probably would have made slightly more money by leaving my house mortgaged and keeping that money invested in stocks. And especially if you look at the last five years, that would have been really true. But I'm still not, I'm still happy with the decision because I sleep better at night just knowing that I have these low monthly bills. And when it really boils down to it, everything is about how you feel. Like the only reason to retire early and to get any money in the first place saved up is because you feel better about it. So I happen to feel better not having any debt on anything. So that's what I do. But the good news is, at least in the type of middle class numbers we're talking about now, uh, the value of your house is not a giant percentage of your total wealth anyway. So it's not like a make or break decision either way. Carl, your thoughts? Yeah, I'm in the camp of not paying it off. And I'm surprised you said, Jonathan, there's a lot of people who support that because uh, I don't find any in my day to day life. Most people are like, I need to pay off the house. I think even Big Earn said that you need to pay off your house before you quit. But uh, yeah, a small part of that is what else I could be doing with the money. I think most of the time you'll do better having it in the S&P 500. 
But the other part of it is just having that money available, like the powder keg of money that I could potentially do something else if some other interesting project comes up. So I don't know if I would have been able to own part of this co-working space if I still had the mortgage. But it's a personal decision and also a self-control decision if having that cash around is going to tempt you to buy a Cadillac Escalade, like pay off your house immediately. Don't think about it for even one more second. Yes, so many people just feel that psychological benefit of having it paid off. While maybe it's a suboptimal mathematical decision, and to Pete's point, it's probably not as bad as most people claim. Man, the psychological benefit of having that paid off, I envy it. I go back and forth with my wife all the time. I'm like, should we pay this thing off? Should we not? I would love to have it paid off. So anyway, just my two cents. But next question I want to ask you guys about a luxurious life. I feel like I live this amazing life of abundance. You know, many people would would look at us and say, oh, you're depriving yourself. But yet I feel like I'm rolling in abundance. Where do you come down on that? Are there any luxuries you would like to buy, but that for some reason you just don't for some reason? So for me, I'll, I'll just give you my two quick things, a hot tub and a sauna for my backyard. It wouldn't cost nearly as much as I probably feared. It would be well under $10,000. I know it would greatly enhance my quality of life, but like I still feel, I don't know, stupid, guilty, whatever word it is. And, and I hate even using those words, but it's true. I have not bought them, even though I would love them and I can afford them by any, any measure. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts generally on the topic and then very specifically about any items that you, you would love to buy, but for whatever reason, something's holding you back. I like your thought process. You think you want hot tub and sauna, but you force yourself to stop and think about it, at least for a while, because um, the more that you can afford and the, the bigger your money situation gets, if you don't check yourself, it gets ridiculous. Like that's how people end up with 10 homes and like memberships to golf clubs that they've never seen, you know, and then like rows and rows of cars is because they don't have this balance of questioning yourself. And I think it's okay to get things that you really do enjoy. I have, I literally own thousands of items myself and a lot of them are pretty nice and luxurious. Like a lot of them are tools or gadgets, you know, smartphone, laptop, the stuff I'm using to talk to you right now, an entire co-working space full of stuff. Most of it, I don't regret buying, but I think that's because I always thought about each thing and made sure that the pros and cons were weighing correctly. And like hot tubs, for example, are notorious for being aspirational purchases that you hop in a few times and then you just, you wish that you had more friends to come and use it after a while. And then people end up selling them on Craigslist for 50 bucks after they've drained, you know, gone moldy and, and had a few seasons of, of underuse. Have you, so have you met Brad? He, he's our neighbor. He lives down the street. He has the sauna and the moldy hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, doesn't, doesn't Carl have a hot tub that he put in and now doesn't use very much? Is that true, Carl? <laughs> I, I do have a hot tub, but I bought it for $50 and it is currently broken and leaking. So uh, <laughs> yeah, now I use it zero percentage of the time. Yes. And how does that make you feel? It's probably a burden on your psyche and like every hot tub can get broken and leaky. So even if you buy a new one, it's still, anyway, that's, that's a trade off. like, you might still come down on the side of getting it, Brad, but it's great that you're thinking about it. And I think that's all it really takes to keep you out of trouble because the wealthier you get, the less that threshold of affordability is going to, to hit you. But there is definitely a point of enough and your life gets more and more complex for everything that you add. And uh, I think I'm already at maximum. I'm maxed out. That's why I don't want anything that I don't already have, because uh, I know that I'd, it would be more work to, to take care of and think about that extra item. And I'm already like feeling pretty, you know, my limited mental capacity is quite full already with everything that I own. Yeah. Consumers of time and mental bandwidth are definitely the enemy of life. Yeah. My latest blog post was about my ongoing battle to not buy a Tesla car, like the Model 3 specifically, because it's beautiful and it does every, you know, it's like the culmination of cool technology that human, humanity has ever invented. But then I would have this car that I'd be worried about getting faded and scratched and keeping track. And I'd worry that I'm not using it enough because there's not really much place for a car in my daily life because I've specifically set up my life where I can bike everywhere. So even though this car is gorgeous and I can afford it, I'm probably not going to buy it for years, if ever, until I really, really am sure that it would enhance my life more than it than it added a tax of mental bandwidth to myself. And I doubt you're going to find it for $50 on eBay. So 
don't know. We'll have to sift through that one. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's true. I could borrow it free from a friend though, because everybody else has a Model Three nowadays, and they're like, "Oh, I hardly ever use it. You can just take it." I drove in Not the Tesla with Mister Money Mustache. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> awesome man. All right, so I got another one for you guys. Like the fire movement. Is this a movement? Is there something in the water? Is there a there there? Like, is this going somewhere? What are your thoughts? Pete, you. <laughs> well, it's certainly good branding. And I did not come up with this idea of fire movement. So I can credit whoever <clears throat> kind of first coined those words. But it's excellent. Like everything is about creating, like my whole blog exists to try to change behaviors, right? And uh, across like hundreds of millions of people. So in order to do that, you have to make ideas that stick in people's head and that they naturally spread themselves. So fire movement is a good idea because as soon as somebody, one of the bloggers or something, put that idea out, I noticed all the newspaper stories and like PBS special and other stuff were repeating it. And now when the public hears this kind of stuff, they're like, oh, the fire movement, that sounds pretty big if it's an entire movement. So just describing it that way already makes it real. Um, and then the, the, the other way to measure it is how many people are aware of these ideas and how many people are practicing it. I think those numbers are definitely better than they've ever been. <clears throat> it's certainly in the millions in the United States alone. And that's pretty big. You know, like most companies would drool over getting that type of market share. So um, so it's pretty good so far. We definitely have a lot of work to do. Like I'm not going to be content until we'll, we're building car free cities where people are walking and playing Frisbee in parks and you know, kids are growing up healthy and outdoorsy and we're doing stuff a bit more like efficiency in terms of happy living. But, you know, luckily I've still got like between 60 and infinity years to live, depending on medical advances. So you got this. Uh, we, we got lots of work that we can still get done. Hey, Pete, our mutual friend Jillian from Montana Money Adventure, she talks about about moving the ball forward. I, I love this phrase that she uses. It's just talking about these little incremental steps. So you know, you guys have this co-working space. Hopefully many more of these are going to pop up throughout, throughout the country and maybe even the world. What steps do you see to move towards that vision that you have? Are there concrete things that the audience can take to move that ball a little bit forward? I think it really depends on how motivated you are. So 99% of the readers and watchers and listeners of our type of blogs and podcasts are just looking to improve their own family life and create a better life for themselves. And that's already great because when you change yourself, you're influencing your friends and your neighborhood. And just for example, walking your kids to school, if you're close enough, instead of driving, that leads to a chain reaction where your friends are going to do it more and you've improved your entire town. Some people, upon realizing how good these results are in their own life, they get a bit more evangelical about it and they want to spread it even more. So those are the type of people who might become writers or bloggers themselves, or they might get involved in city governments and try to, for example, make their town more pedestrian friendly or make their car infrastructure safer so less people are harmed by cars. And it, it really doesn't matter. Um, you know, I love when people take responsibility, but everyone's going to do what works for them. And it still seems to, to spread regardless. And I think the reason it, the idea of financial independence tends to spread by itself is because it's fundamentally right. Like it aligns with human nature. And a lot of the corporate stuff we've been doing for the last 50 years is directly at odds with human nature. It's like consuming more and more and working more and more so we don't even see our own kids. And frankly, like sitting in cars where your physical body rots away and you're just like stressed out by traffic and pollution. These things are fundamentally not what we evolved to do. Like this is painful for a human and it makes us less happy. So all I'm doing with uh, the stuff I write about is trying to align the real world to be more like what us as humans or creatures that have certain living conditions that make us happier. I'm trying to make the real world match what we like to do in our lives. So that's why it's going to be a winning prospect all over is, and it markets itself is because people live better when they do this. So I think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a long-term win. You know, I love that the mainstream has picked it up. I love that Market Watch has added a fire movement tab to all of their money articles now. Like it's an actual thing. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh -huh. but I think the counterpoint when the mainstream picks it up is like the messaging, right? Like, oh, be careful of the fire movement or five things that five reasons you should never retire early, whatever, whatever, like listicle yourself to death. What I want to come back to is like, you guys are 
essentially retired using your liberal definition of the word and more importantly, financial independence. You've reached that point and you're several years past that metric. In your case, Pete, well over a decade. Should we be worried? Is there anything that you realize now? You're like, oh man, wow. I wish I had followed the normal narrative. I wish I had stayed at work. So Carl, I'll start with you. Like, what are your thoughts? Do you look back at this choice to walk away from corporate America with regret? I've never had that thought even once. I I guess when I first stopped, I missed the big paychecks that, that I would get every Friday, that direct deposit into the bank account. But uh, I don't think there's any amount of money that would cause me to go back to work. Uh, the main thing is figuring out what's important to you. And usually that doesn't revolve around money. Like vacations are nice. And I guess a new a new Tesla would make me slightly happier, but I'd have no use for it because I don't drive anywhere. But uh, yeah, figure out what makes you happy and realize that that usually doesn't involve money, at least not directly, and go with it. Yeah, the quick answer to your question is that no, you should not be worried because worry is a waste of time. There's never a reason to worry about anything. But um, financial independence is really just the starting point. As I said earlier, it's, uh, it's getting rid of the money worry, which is a great thing to get rid of initially, and then begin this journey of exploring what really makes a good life for you. And it's really a much more human way to live is, is like a long, it's like being a, in a 60 year university free form class where every day you learn something different. And uh, yeah, I certainly have no regrets and it's, it's challenging, but it would have been much harder for me if I were also dependent on a job at this age, like, oh man, I would, I could see myself having like some serious midlife crises at this stage, being 44 years old and still dependent on a job and worried about that job going away, if uh, and you know, feeling like I'd be out on the streets if I didn't have it. So it's like it's a no-brainer. It's a it's definitely a win. Yeah, the biggest issue I have with the fire movement is you see people discover it and they embrace it, and then they'll be like, "Hey, I've done my numbers and I only have like 830 more days until I could retire." And when people say that, I I get all queasy inside because that's the wrong way to go about life. And that's the wrong way to view fire. You this coming to... from Mr. 1500. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wanted yes. to say that. John. Exactly. I was so close. <laughs> exactly. And you're totally, you're totally right. You, you are absolutely right. Cause I realized about halfway through, I'm like, what are you running to? You're just running away from a stressful situation. What the heck are you going to do after you quit your job? This is ridiculous. And I, I even thought about deleting the blog because I'm going to look like a fool because I have to stay at work because I have no idea what comes after this. So if anyone's listening, don't lament that you're not fired yet. Even if you have a pointy haired boss who you hate, find some way to find happiness in every single day and think about what life is going to be like afterwards, but start planning for that now and start living life now. Don't wait to live life until after you've hit your number. Do it right now. All right, guys. Now, in most shows, that would be the end of the episode. But on this show, Pete. We would love to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? Yes, of course. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, these questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. All right, Pete, question number one, your favorite blog that's not your own? I don't really read blogs. So that's a pretty tricky question, but I'm, I've become a bit of a fan of 1500 Days recently. And I especially liked the most recent one article about uh, how Carl allegedly hates the 4% rule of like how much you have to save for early retirement because he, he put it really, really cleanly on why it's really nonsense that people spend their lives worrying about this super academic pointless like I save 3.2 or 4.0. It's like, just relax and retire. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, question number two, your favorite article of all time. Now I'll give you a little bit of leeway here. This can be either, you know, someone else's article or one of your own. Is there one article that you wrote out of the 500 plus articles over the last, you know, close to seven years that for you still stands out? Yeah. The funny part is my favorite article is not anybody else's favorite article. From my perspective, it's this one that's called The Practical Benefits of Outrageous Optimism. And it starts out with this photograph of Captain Picard, and uh, it makes me laugh at my own stuff, and I think it's very practical. Whereas other people, they they usually talk about my 
you know, shockingly simple math to early retirement, which is more of just like a dry, somewhat mathematical post. So for my own entertainment, one of the favorite for like the purpose of my blog, reaching people, that other one is a favorite. And I'm glad you let me pick uh, stuff from my own because I really can't remember, you know, on short notice what my other favorite stuff on the internet is that I've read. Carl, why okay, you, I've, go ahead, I've Carl. got to chime in here for a second. So if you go back to episode 14, when you asked me that same question, my answer was the same as Pete's, the outrageous benefit or the benefits of outrageous optimism, because, uh, yeah, I, I can't believe we're on the same page with that. I mean, you guys are the, learning the so about much me. about each other. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, now I'm kind of embarrassed, but uh, the easy part about fire is the numbers. It easy is a bad word. It's not easy. You have to work. You have to say uh, simple, not easy, right? It's yeah, simple. simple. Wrapping your emotions around it. That's the hard part. And that post probably set me free more than any others. I'm like, wow, stop worrying, you stupid jerk. None of that stuff you worry about all the time ever comes to pass. So I actually printed out the post and I have it in my office hanging up. So every time I start thinking about some nonsense, I look, read it. I see Captain Picard there and make myself read that article. I've probably read it like 500 times about now because my nature is to worry. So sorry to hijack the questions. No, that's great, Carl. I absolutely love that. So you literally have this hanging up in Mr. Money Mustache World Headquarters? I have it hanging up in my office. In your office. Yeah, it would (laughs) be more poetic if it was here and I can show you right now, but... All right, Pete, question number three, your favorite life hack. It is discovering that bicycles are faster than cars to get around in most situations because it frees people like me who are impatient with inefficiency. There's nothing more inefficient than like looking at where you're trying to drive in your car, but you see like 10 other people bumbling in front of you in a parking lot like, oh, I just want to be there. And in a bike, you just slice through everything and you park exactly in front of the door and then you go in and you get home and you like, if there's something in the way, like some stupid curb, you just jump over the top of it. And like on top of all that, it makes you more physically fit and saves you money. It would just change the entire world if everybody knew this, because I see everybody still fighting in the parking lot, even right now, after I've been writing about this stuff for eight years. I'm pretty sure I have the bike trailer because of you as well. Just <laughs> good. Bike trailers are the secrets to carrying stuff on your bike. Everyone's like, well, I love to bike, but what if I have a pencil that I have to bring home? I'd better it's bring a real like my concern, pickup truck. Pete. It's a real yeah, concern. <laughs> it is. I mean, it's like people don't know what a backpack is. They don't know what a trailer is. They don't realize you can carry kids on bikes and they love it. It's just, yeah, it's just certain hacks you got to get out there and bicycles have these it's already solved for you. Oh, what if it's not like exactly 72 degrees and perfectly sunny on my bike? Yes. Like then you point out like clothing exists oh. and you can use different <laughs> amounts of clothing too. <laughs> All right. Qu- question number four. Oh, I'm excited about this one. Your biggest financial mistake. Um, it was basically a business mistake. So shortly after retiring early, set for life financially, I thought, well, I, I like working and I like carpentry, so I'm going to start a construction business. But it rapidly, like through the interaction with an optimistic friend, it turned into like a, a speculative house building business where we were buying land and building luxury, like eco-friendly houses on it in this super expensive neighborhood at the top of a housing bubble. We built beautiful houses. The first one sold immediately for more than the asking price. And then the second one basically never sold. And we rode it down like a burning roller coaster full of skeletons into hell and it was like super super scary and i saw my life fortune dwindling because i had something like five hundred thousand dollars of my own money in this company basically in the house and i caused you know just wrecked my first few years of retirement because i'm i'm a worry prone person going back i i could have just told myself don't worry you're going to be fine but i didn't know that i was like 31 years old at the time 32 and uh whew, just don't do that if you're going to retire take it easy collaborate with your friends, help them build fences, but don't go start a million dollar company involving credit. Yeah. Talking um, about hard work, fences are hard, but your real estate story is worse than Brad's. (laughs) Worse than a fence. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Pete, I think that might uh, answer question number five here, but just in case the advice you would give your younger self. Don't start the construction company. And in general though, I would tell him just to not worry about anything and like start with the more obvious stuff because i was always a little bit of an anxious kid i would be afraid as like three-year-old to go to another kid's birthday party without my mom there i had like an anxiety type personality and i had to i've had to beat that out of myself throughout the subsequent decades 
And a lot of stuff, including retiring early, was partly a mechanism to protect myself from worry. I was like, well, if I get all the money taken care of, I never have to worry about money. But it also taught me about worry itself. And now I'd say, uh, for the most part, I'm I'm relatively normal, and and certain things I'm better than normal about not worrying, but other things I still worry about. So that's the best thing to counsel myself, and I think a lot of people would would benefit from this advice too. They tend to worry about things like way more than they need to, and the worry definitely hurts you, and you can recover from situations a lot more than you give yourself credit for. It. Bottom line is you're going to be making a few phone calls and pressing a few mouse buttons and keyboard buttons to solve almost any problem these days. So just relax and do it. All right. Now we do have a bonus question for you. What purchase have you made over the past 12 months that has brought the most value to your life? And if you say a Tesla, I'm going to end this conversation right now. Yep. I haven't bought a car of any sort in the last 12 months, but it's cool. I do have an answer to this question. So, you know, my wife and I separated, if people don't know this yet, it's an important personal detail. And at that moment, I decided to spring for like buying my own place, my own house in the neighborhood, because I always realized I'm a homeowner at heart. I love having control over stuff. And I want it to be right within a short walking distance of the family, right? We, we don't want to be one of those far apart families. So that happens to be the most expensive neighborhood in an expensive city. So I paid extra to get this, these privileges. And I'm really, really happy that I did. Like that place has given me joy and solace every night. And it's a wonderful place to host my son and friends. There's been like a never ending stream of visitors coming through there because I got extra bedrooms. It's a small place. It's a small house, but it's more than just a budget apartment or like could live in a van down by the river if I wanted to save money. And I'm glad I spent more on housing that that really meets my my lifestyle needs. And uh, yeah, I feel that every time I'm there, every time I open the door and every time I play loud music in there and every time I go to bed. Um, so home is has always been a big part of my things that make me happy. So I'm glad I stuck to my being willing to spend money on it in this case. Awesome. Well, you know, Carl from Mr. 1500 Days and Pete, Mr. Money Mustache, I think people know where to find you. But Pete, in your case, I'm curious, most people have heard of your blog. Most people have read your blog, but there probably is an individual that is hearing about it for the first time on the show. And my question to you is someone comes to your content, you've got 500 plus articles, like how would you want them to interact with your blog? What is the best way for them to dive into that content? Just read whatever's on the homepage, like your suggestions. Yeah. The good news is it is set up specifically for that. Like if someone were to just go to mrmoneymustache.com, there's like a little flippy box with five or to 10, you know, recommended articles to whet your appetite. And then there's also clear links saying like, are you really hardcore? Here's a list of all the articles. It makes it really easy to navigate. Or do you like to read offline? Here's a link to the app. You can get a free app that reads my blog super nice for like both Android and iPhones. So I'm hoping it's pretty easy to get to get into it just from with that as a starting point. Awesome. And Carl, for our community, someone's listening to this. They want to find out more about your story. We featured your story in episode 14 of our podcast. Highly recommend that people go back and check that out. But if they want to go straight to your blog and find out more, what is the best way to do that? Uh, they would go to 1500days.com. And I always recommend uh, that they don't go, go visit someone useful like Pete first, because my blog is more of a, if you want to see what life is like after fire, read my blog. But if you want to read the mechanics, read Pete or Early Retirement Extreme or Mad Scientist, get that down and, and then you can read my blog. So thank you. Awesome. Carl and Pete, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It's been great being with you. Brad, we knew that this was a special episode and we knew that when we're talking to Carl and Pete and in particular, Mr. Money Mustache, that our show has been going for two years. We have not had him on the show yet. This was our opportunity to really find out more about his story. But I think more than that, we had an obligation because our community is so familiar with him to go a little bit deeper, like we don't need Pete to teach us the how of Phi, right? But I think as a leader in this community, as a guy who has a message that has resonated around the country, going behind the scenes and walking through kind of the four different goals that we, we set out. How did this happen? Tell us a little bit more about how we got here. Tell us a little bit more about community building, second generation Phi, and how to create reality for the future. What does it mean when you're 10 years post Phi? What do your goals and objectives look like for yourself and for those around you? And Pete and Carl brought it. I was so compelled by the information and the story that they brought to this conversation and grateful to them for being so generous with their time. Yeah, Jonathan, I agree completely. This exceeded even my lofty expectations. 
And Carl and Pete have become friends of mine over the last couple of years. And it's this nice treat, right? It's a rare opportunity to get to ask them these real in-depth questions and go back to those formative moments. When Pete is starting this blog, what is he thinking? Does he think of himself as a writer? Like I've always wanted to ask him that question. And to get that opportunity today was was really fantastic. And what we spent a lot of time here talking about, Jonathan, was obviously the FI community and how we help foster this and bring it together, right? We see this movement. How do we bring it into people's lives? And I think that is a huge goal of mine. And I know it is for Pete and Carl as well. If you got value from today's episode, and if you've been getting value from the episodes up to this point, just take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. Just let the providers know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. If you want to support us in what we're doing here at Choose FI, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. To do that, just go to choosefi.com slash iTunes. Two, use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to choosefi.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of FI, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free and just go to choosefi.com slash PC. P is in Paul, C is in Cat. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 100. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.